All right, we might move on. So uh, what I'm going to talk about now is just a, a project that we've recently completed and just published um, in PLOS, which I'll give you the reference to a little bit later. And it's about how addressing this issue of how do we engage uh, difficult groups such as medical staff. And I suppose it starts with a question which uh, someone mentioned to me. I was at a conference once and this uh, advertising guy said to me, you know, when I was whinging about doctors and nurses with their hand hygiene, he said, well, don't be an idiot. You know, if you're trying to sell a Volvo to a doctor versus a nurse, would you use the same advertising strategy? And of course you wouldn't. Um, so why do you expect doctors to do uh, any, you know, as well as nurses when you're basically advertising to them the same way as you, you are the rest of the staff? So it raised this issue of uh, are there differences in personality or mindset that perhaps we could tap into that really the advertising community already know about. And you know, it addresses also issues, you know, why is it that doctors largely distrust or ignore evidence-based guidelines and why are the hand hygiene rates worse for them? And so it addresses this issue of so-called colour grid and this was the method that we used to assess personalities personality profiling. It's based on this guy, Gert Hofstetter, who is uh, well known in the personality field, worked for IBM uh, in terms of uh, getting uh, staff, to, uh, how to get staff to do things they didn't want to do. And interestingly with Color Grid, they combined the theory of Hofstetter with their databases, the entire Australian census of 18 and a half million people from the second last census and cross-linked it with this um, marketing company, Roy Morgan Marketing, where they've got about 50 years of marketing and came up with this so-called colour grid. So all of us have a personality profile. If you, any of you have done personality profiles, you'll know that a lot of them divide our personality into four. Well, this is dividing each of the quadrants into another four, so 16 different components. And some of us have more interest in some things and less in others. And of course, our personalities sort of don't change too much during our life, but our mindset does. So when we're young and we're thinking of the future and so forth and we move into you know, getting our job and then maybe getting, you know, having kids or whatever, then finally as you get older you're looking back and taking a more philosophical long-term view about what your grandchildren are going to be like. So our mindset is quite important and there's a way that you can categorise this in terms of scoring it using one of these surveys. As an example, when I first did my um, personality profile, which I'd say was quite unusual I'm told, um, anyway, uh, you know, the, the uh, Charles who runs this said, uh, I said to him, all right, you know, tell me, fancy pants, what car do I own? He said, well, it'll be a Ford or a Holden, it'll be white or silver, and it'll be a station wagon. And I had a white Commodore station wagon. And Rhea Martin, who I don't think's here, but uh, Rhea Martin, who considered herself very special, uh, you know, uh, very unique, and uh, so, of course, he said, well, you'll have a sports car, it won't be a real one because you can't afford it, but it'll be red, and she had a red Ford Capri and she was completely devastated that he could predict this. So what we decided to do was use colour grid profiling um, to characterise healthcare worker groups and actually we did both surveys of healthcare workers and also compared it to the uh, a set of generic information non-identifying from the HR department and to assess whether there are any differences between the healthcare worker groups. And so and then use these advertising strategies to say, well, how would you advertise uh, regarding hand hygiene, antimicrobial stewardship and isolation for MROs because medical staff are hopeless at following their gowns and gloves. So, of course, uh, some of you may or may not be aware there are eight different healthcare worker categories in all hospitals of Australia. They're very standardised, in fact. And so we consolidated these eight, so all the three medical staff groups, senior med full-time senior medical staff, part-time, and HMOs, and then the nursing and uh, ancillary support, which are like physios and allied health, and then the non-clinical contact groups. So we synthesised them down to three categories. And we analysed this at, uh, in, in five sites, Austin, uh, at Monash Medical Centre with Rhonda, at Bendigo Health with Jane Helston and Jason, at Westmead Hospital in New South Wales, and with Dave Gordon at Flinders Medical Centre in Adelaide. And we then used the uh, colour grid uh, system to compare what healthcare workers were like to the average Australian personality or mindset, because many politicians would assume that healthcare workers have very similar mindsets uh, to the rest of the population, but of course we all know that's not true, we're extremely different. And so this is just an example of the survey which was done online. Now I'm going to give you a tute here about how to read a colour grid. So if your response to one of these questions is actually on the mean, then it would appear as a dot, you wouldn't be able to see it. If you're above the mean, 
except different from the average for your group, it'll, the box will gradually get larger and larger. If you're less than the mean, then you'll, you'll be a circle. That component of your personality will be a circle, so it'll get larger and larger. So what we're looking for is differences from the average. Okay. So as an example, here is the uh, colour grid for uh, HMOs, which we'll come back to, and you can see they're very strong in yellow and black. Black is struggling, worrying about your future. Yellow is I'm looking forward to my future. Turquoise is... Uh, is all about uh, interest in new technology and so forth. And so that's just an example. On the other hand, there, you know, there's not much, all down this left side is all about family and worrying about, you know, looking after your, your grandparents and your kids and so forth. Well, young HMOs aren't worried about that at that stage. So in the end, we analysed 34,000 healthcare workers, so a lot, and of those 34,000, just over 1,000 filled in the survey. And what I'm going to show you now, I, we don't have time to go into it all, but basically I can say the contribution from each of the five sites was very comparable. Survey participants were very similar, slightly older, only 2.8 years though, so not really a big difference. And amazingly, the prediction from the HR data was almost identical to the survey data. It was absolutely scary how predictive it was. So all of you who think you're special, you're not as special as you think you are. And that's why when you open up your iPad and you see those ads down the right-hand side, they're not random. They know what you've been searching on the internet. They know everything. Most, many times they know your purchases from your credit card. So uh, if you want to get paranoid, this is the way to do it because it's actually reality. So the, and in, interestingly, the results from all five sites are extremely similar. So I'm just going to jump over that and you can read the manuscript. So here are healthcare workers compared to... The Australia, all of Australia, 18 and a half million, seven and a half million households. And you can see that actually healthcare workers are, are right up here. They're okay with uh, change and adapting to change. They're looking forward to the future. There's an element of struggling down here. I'm a bit uncertain about how I'm going to make ends meet, but it's not that dominant. And there's this navy, which we'll come back to. This is about, I feel secure. And, uh, and some of us feel more secure than others. But the personality profile would be overall, and you probably don't need a colour grid to do this, if you're affluent, you established have higher than average levels of career-minded professionals and post-secondary education, quick to take up new technology and new experiences, very well informed but cynical about advertising messages, challenging to others who do not share their interests or concern to make a difference and leave a heritage of success. Does that ring true? Well, if you said to the average politician, they wouldn't know that. Like, they're all economists or auctioneers or, or lawyers. You only did biology when they were 14 and then went on to commerce, right? So wh now what we're going to do, that's compared to the Australian population, now we're going to normalise all healthcare workers. So we're going to take that colour grid I just showed you and now that's the average, right? No dots. And we're going to compare the differences between doctors, nurses and cleaners and then between doctors. So here's... Uh, doctors overall, and this you can see that they are up still uh, compared to the average for healthcare workers, still up in this top corner. And the assessment from the personality profiling people would be independent, progressive thinkers, information driven, need direct personalised communication, they're cynical about blanket uh, messages and hidden agendas, compliance governs behaviour, and they need to highlight the individual positive and negative consequences of their behaviour. This is medical stuff. And so they, you know, they consider themselves independent thinkers, feel they should be able to act autonomously as they're, as they're well informed. They understand the intent of the rules, but the rules are for everyone else, but are capable of rationalising why they don't necessarily apply to them. And they highlight that adhere, you need to highlight that adherence could make a positive and a negative difference. And in some ways, as Charles, uh, our, the guy who's working with us, said, they're like cats. They're all independent and they believe they can do whatever they want and they believe they know what's best. Sound like me? Good. So here in nursing staff, remember, it's a bit distorted because 50% of the workforce are nurses, so they're going to be pretty much on the mean because they're contributing so much to the overall data set. And you can see the group that filled in this actually were a little bit older and they're down this left-hand column dominantly where they're sort of thinking about their families and, and, and so forth. And the, the personality that different from doctors. They're balancing their needs against the needs of others. They're focused on the present, not the past or future. They're not exclusively information driven. Once they become emotional and believe in the cause, you don't ac actually have to educate them. They believe in it as the cause, right? We're going to do this together. It's about, you know, them and the team rather than me as an individual. And, you know, as I say, once they become highly committed 
and emotion come in, it's at that point um, you've got them. So it's important to engage them in the cause as well as the behaviour and focus on the present and intervention should focus on the immediate action. You know, we can do this, we should do it now and help us to do this as a team. What about the, the uh, uh, cleaners and so forth? Well, they're all actually, de none, of, none of this innovation stuff, they're just worried about how they're going to make ends meet. Tell me what I need to do and I'll do it. If I don't do it, what's the punishment? And of course, this is a problem, say, for my institution, because we have PSAs, you know, these patient service attendants, and they have, we give them a choice. They can either clean, run the errands, take the bloods, you know, do this or that. Well, you know, firstly, most of them are men, so they want to clean. But also, too, if they don't want choice. What you should be saying is from 9 till 10, you'll do this. From 10 till 11, you'll do that. Whereas if you did that to a nurse or a doctor, they'd get stuff. They'd say, get stuff, you know. So they're not information driven. They're very comfortable with rules. The rules do not need justification. They need some, the rules provide certainty. Then these people don't lack cognitive ability, they just lack information. And often there's that, edu there's that language issue too which comes into it. And importantly compared perhaps to us, you know, work is generally not part of their life satisfaction. You know, I come to work so I can live my life. My work is not my life. Whereas for many of us, that's, our work is more of our life actually. So there is, you know, some ways in which you should address that by providing rules and protocolising things and making it, uh, th this group will enjoy that sort of approach. So what about differences between doctors? So here are the full-time medical staff who filled in the survey. All up here in this top end, no, their income secure, so they're big negative black, they're not worried about how ends are going to meet. They're interested, so if you look at, they can handle change and especially informed evidence-based change. They feel they're actively making an individual choice. They want to make good or correct informed decisions and they like measuring against those decisions. But you need to highlight the, uh, the, the, the evidence that guides their required behaviour change and establish a clear monitoring framework. And if they're, you know, it's interesting, if they're non-compliant with something. It's probably not that they're bad, it's just likely that they've got some information that tells them that what you're telling them to do is not right and that's why they're non-compliant, so you better think about that. On the other hand, on the other hand, here are the uh, visit VMOs or visiting docs. These are the guys with the private practices who come in for a couple of sessions a week. Well, they're quite different and in fact, if we drew that uh, Navy thing to scale, it would be that big. And so this is a totally different mindset. So these, this navy is about affluential. Jeez. This is about affluential. They're affluent and they're influential. Their personal mm -hmm. reputation and prestige is highly important and some of their authority, sense of authority comes from this. So they're highly individualistic, you know, I'm special. I mean, all the rules apply to everyone else, but I'm special. I know I'm special because I've got a big private practice and actually, What's likely to be more effective for this group is not saying, look, if you hand hygiene a lot, people will think better of you because they know they're already good. What's likely to affect this group is to say, well, if you don't hand hygiene, your patients might think worse of you. They might think you're not a very good doctor and that would be incredibly effective. So this is something we haven't done with hand hygiene but is likely to be really useful. So I've covered that. So here are the HMOs, residents and registrars, and they're all in this yellow and black. They're worried about their future, but they're interested in their future. and They're, they're interested in new technology, but they want that black Mercedes um, at the end of it. And in fact, if we drew that to scale, the yellow and black boxes are absolutely massive. So the yellow is all about the future. So there's strong focus on future progression and career progression, uh, compliance uh, driven, they, they need clear guidance. It's important to highlight, you know, if you do this, your career will progress. If you don't do it, your career is stuffed, or maybe slightly softer than that. Um, com so compliance, the main thing is if you hand hygiene, this shows you're a future leader, okay? So just in the last few minutes, what we thought we'd then do is we asked Charles to design an educational package for us or an advertising package based on these philosophies. And we chose these three things. So hand hygiene, because it's simple and we, all the things you know. Antibiotic stewardship, because it only happens at certain times, but it's very important to that individual and the group. And then finally, you know, wearing gloves and gowns, which really doesn't help that patient at all, but it helps the wider herd in terms of reducing spread. And so these are the sort of things. So the messages, the strap lines, you know, for, for the doctors would be hand hygiene appropriately, you know it's right. 
the nursing staff, you know, every time you hand hygiene, it shows you care. Or every 50 times you hand hygiene, you save a life. Whereas if you said that to a doctor, they'd say, don't be ridiculous. You know, I know that's not true. And of course, it's not completely true. But on the other hand, we know that staff rates have plummeted since we've been doing the hand hygiene rate. You know, we've gone from 62 staff MRSA bacteremias at Austin in 2001. And last year, we had six. The only thing we've done is hand hygiene. Whereas with the cleaners, you can say good hand hygiene is essential to doing a job. You know where to hand hygiene, so just do it. Brackets for else. What about antibiotic stewardship? Think about what's needed. Use antibiotics carefully. Reassess the situation and prescribe appropriately. For nurses, antibiotic prescribing is a doctor's, doctor's responsibility. Caring for the patient is yours. Well, caring for your patient means it's okay to ask if, an if the antibiotic is appropriate. Well, care for your patients. Check their antibiotics are appropriate. And of course, for cleaners, antibiotics are not relevant in this case. What about MROs? MRO isolation, it's too important, so follow the rules. Or isolation rules are important, so follow them and avoid their consequences. Don't take the bug for the nurses. Don't take the bugs in this room home with you. Follow the rules. So do you see the message is the same, but it's different. The slant is different, and it's targeting this group. Whereas for the cleaners, it's keep your job. Follow the rules. And they won't be insulted by that. They'll be reassured by it. Okay, they won't be insulted. So finally, in the last minute or two, just uh, we're now going to break it into the full-timers, the part-timers, and the uh, visiting staff. So uh, you know, if we say the full-timers are Steve Jobs, not quite like me, but anyway. Uh, the benefits of good hand hygiene in preventing hospital-acquired infections are indisputable. On the other hand, for the visiting doc, it's unless you do good hand hygiene, your reputation will suffer. Well, good hand hygiene is good medicine, bad hand hygiene is bad medicine. No one tolerates bad medicine. Well, finally, good med hand hygiene is good medicine. No one tolerates bad medicine. And the mental picture for this group is that if they don't do it, their career, their black Mercedes, will be towed away. <laughs> what about the house officers? Well, realise your potential for firm good hand hygiene. Don't wreck your future by striking out on hand hygiene. And then again, for stewardship, you know, antimicrobial prescribing should be rational with clear indication, duration, expected outcome. Or, you know, for the BMOs, use of broad spectrum antibiotics will have consequences and you will be held accountable for your actions. You're, you are smart. We know you're smart and you know you're smart, so prescribe appropriately. And finally, you know, check and get antibiotic approval. You know your career is worth it. And finally, for MROs, you know, placing patients in isolation is inconvenient, but the risk of transmitting MROs to other patients is a much bigger issue. Whereas for the VMOs, be, you know, the, the bugs are smart too, you know, like you, so follow the isolation rules. And finally, for the HMOs, it's easy to follow the isolation protocols and lead the way. Don't jeopardise your future. Or show us that you're a leader for the future by following them. So uh, obviously there's some limitations. This is Australian data, so it may not be applicable to other countries. It, it only assessed five sites, but there's a lot of healthcare workers, 34,000 is by far the biggest. Uh, one of our docs sent me an email saying this was all psychobabble um, and that his assessment was that he was a, somewhat of an only retentive doc who kind of couldn't move on to bigger pictures. He then sent a series of five emails to me uh, responding back and forth about how his thing was slightly inaccurate and, and at the end of it I thought I think the assessment's entirely correct for you. <laughs> um, but um, you know, so what we plan to do is now use some of these ideas in the coming campaigns that you'll see starting to unfold. Um, and I really want to uh, acknowledge the people uh, both at the Austin, uh, my registrars Kai, Catherine and Nenad, Rhonda at Monash, uh, Jane Helston and Jason at uh, Bendigo and Dave Gordon at uh, Flinders and uh, Lynn Gilbert in particular at Westmead and Charles Zurab, who's a pretty innovative guy, and of course Marilyn Crookshanks from the Commission. So in conclusion, healthcare workers are different to the Australian population. There are notable differences between the healthcare worker groups, as wouldn't be a surprise really, but for the first time we've actually shown it. Survey data allows high resolution due to individual responses and defining the differences, and uh, you know, these personality profiling provides a rationale for different culture change strategies, which we'll see in the next little while. And thanks for your attention. I'll just uh, put here the uh, publication if you're interested in looking up the greater detail.